Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. History 101, Episode 20, War, Armies, Legitimacy, and Ancient Greece. So what type of military did the ancient Greeks have? Mesopotamian chariots? Big, solid horses? Bronze, light chariots pulled behind them? A well-trained driver and an expertly trained bowman created from the nobility. What about mercenaries? You just hire a bunch of experienced people, kind of like Sargon did, and you form an army that way. How about professional, full-time, highly trained citizen soldiers? Kind of the way a modern army is. You take your own people, and you train them into highly trained soldiers? The answer is no, no, and no, with one exception. No, they can't make Mesopotamian chariots. Why? Because we talked about it. They're in the mountains. Chariots need flat land. And two, they're poor. Chariots are massively expensive. Even here, even now. In the time of the Greeks. What about mercenaries? Again, no. Way too expensive. And the professional, highly trained citizen soldiers? No. With the one exception. And we'll talk about that in a second. But again, way too expensive. Remember, if you have a professional, highly trained citizen soldier, he's not a farmer. That's all he's doing. Whether or not he goes to war. So, Most of the time, you're paying for a soldier to not be at war. That's expensive. Remember, our military has a million total people, so maybe 500,000 troops, maybe less. It has about a million people in the the military, but a whole lot of those people are like lawyers. They're logistics they're not frontline soldiers and our military costs 700 billion dollars a year it's 60 percent of what our discretionary budget is so a professional trained citizen soldier army is incredibly expensive so the greeks can't have it now yes The Spartans are the exception, and they are the exception to every rule in Greece. So they kind of don't count when we discuss, quote unquote, the Greeks, because you could always go, well, what about the Spartans? And I'm going to say, yes, but they're exceptional and they cultivated their weirdness. They wanted other people to think they were too weird. This is the story of the black gruel. The story of the black rule is the Spartans would eat in mess halls all together, you know, because they they separated their boys and their girls at the age of seven into barracks to make them into professional soldiers. And so the girls went and lived with girls and the boys went and lived with boys. And we'll have talk a little bit about that later. Um, And when you ate, you ate together as a unit, as your phalanx, Right. And people would come and visit the Spartans and they'd invite them to eat. Come and eat what the Spartans eat. And they would eat this black, disgusting gruel. Whatever it was made out of. Roots and all kinds of... And that wasn't what they normally ate. But they ate it for these guests. Why? Because they wanted the guests to think the Spartans were really tough. They're so tough they'll eat this disgusting gruel. Rather than have like a filet, you know, something really delicious, ice cream for dessert, you know. No, they eat this black gruel. And so they walk away going, oh, those Spartans are effed up. They must be tough if they eat that. And so it's a cultivated weirdness. They want other people to think they're weird. They're tough, but weird. So remember... Never say, but the Spartans, because you could say, but the Spartans for almost everything 
involving the Greeks. They're just they're 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 just exceptional. They just they're the exception to every rule when it comes to the Greeks. So how are we going to fight? Well, we're going to fight in a phalanx. So what is a phalanx? A phalanx is men standing shoulder to shoulder, forming a box, wearing bronze armor, and using a shield that overlaps the man next to you and a spear. And what is the purpose of this phalanx? To make men not run away. See, here's the thing. Except for the Spartans, see how this works? Except for the Spartans, all of the guys in every other army in Greece, for every polis, are pretty much farmers or craftsmen. They're not professionals. And they go out every summer to fight a battle against somebody. It is not a question of if. It is a question of when. The Greeks fight each other all the time. Why? They're poor. They need stuff in the mountains. And so if you have a neighbor who finds a gold mine, well, they're going to get rich. Well, you don't want them to get rich. And it could be your gold. All you have to do is take that mountain. Well, they're not going to want you to take that mountain, so you're going to have to fight it out. Now, you're both going to fight it out with your farmers. And farmers are going to run away. It's the right thing to do. When faced with 5,000 people who want to kill you, and you don't know what to do, the best thing to do is get the heck out of there. And so what the phalanx does is force men to fight. The first is shoulder to shoulder. You can't turn. You can't back up. You can only move forward. And if you don't want to move forward, believe me, the guys behind you are going to push you forward. It is uncomfortably close, gentlemen. Very uncomfortable from front to back and back to front. You are making very good friends with the people around you. The second is they wore bronze armor. And this is kind of the first peoples who are going to be heavily armored in our class. The thing that made the phalanx scary to Mesopotamians was the bronze armor. Why? Because the Mesopotamians, the Persians, the Egyptians, they don't wear bronze armor. One, armor is hard to find. They don't live in mountains. The second thing is it's hot. The third thing is, in Mesopotamian Egypt, you're on flat land. So speed matters more. In the mountains, speed doesn't matter. Where are you going? You're in the mountains. You can't go around. You can't flank. You can't jump into someone's, someone jump behind them. You have to go through them. So a phalanx is kind of, in some ways, like a tank. It is built to sit there and slam away in battle. The spear, you want to keep the enemy as far away from you as possible. Why? Because you don't know how to fight and you don't want to fight. And so you want to keep them as far away from you as possible because up close where you're smelling their breath and you're hearing them say, I'm going to kill you and eat your eyes is scary. Like, think about it. You have a rabid raccoon in your attic. How are you going to get that rat, raccoon out of your attic? Now you're like, oh, well, I'm going to go shoot him with my big gun. Well, you have a daughter who's like, no, don't shoot the raccoon. And so, okay, it's not a rabid raccoon, but it's a regular raccoon. It's a cute raccoon. It's a mommy with three babies. How are you going to get that raccoon out of your house? Right? You can't blast away with your shotgun. Your daughter would like freak out. Raccoon guts all over your walls. That ain't working. So what are you going to do? I'm going to guarantee you, you get the longest piece of wood you can find, the longest stick you can find, and you poke that raccoon till it goes away. Go away, raccoon. Go. Don't get anywhere. You do not want to be wrestling a raccoon. You are not Will Farrell in any of his comedy movies where it's going to end badly when you wrestle a raccoon. It's going to eat your face and nibble on your nose. So you get a spear to keep people away from you. What about the shield? Well, the shield overlaps the man next to you. 
Why? Why doesn't it cover you? That would make the most sense, right? Well, remember, you don't want people to run away. Okay. So if you're covering yourself, if you have a shield that can cover yourself, you might want to run away because you could defend yourself. But if your shield overlaps the man next to you, if you run away, you expose the man next to you. And that's a big deal because we'll talk about who will be standing next to you. And the person, if the person next to you runs away, now you're exposed. You're going to get killed. And so it's in everyone's interest to stand there and fight. You are li literally fighting for the man next to you. When, when modern Marines, and I've had plenty of students, modern Army, modern Marines say, I fight for my brother. I fight for the person next to me. Like, it's metaphorical. They're in the same unit. They train together. They, I'm not saying they don't have an emotional connection and they don't stand a line. But in Greece, it is literal. It is not metaphorical. It's not like I fight for my brothers next. To, you are literally fighting for your brother standing right next to you in an ancient Greek phalanx. So that you didn't want to run away. Now, the other thing is it tells you how long battles were. So the shield is a 20 pound piece of wood covered in bronze, right? If you, if it protected you, if you held it in your hand, if the straps, if you held the straps in your hand, all of that weight would be on your wrist. Well, go to the gym if you can after COVID and pick up an 18 to 22 pound dumbbell and now hold it out in front of your chest and time how long it takes before that starts to fall down. I'll give most of you 30 seconds, maybe a minute, because that's what a kite shield was in the Middle Ages. And a kite shield you held in your hand, you protected yourself, like, you know, you had your sword and your shield. Well, you'd lift it up, protect yourself, hit the guy, fight the guy, defeat the guy, and it was over in about 20 to 30 seconds. You didn't have these long standoffs. You, you couldn't lift your arm that much. So the Greek battles are going to go longer. They're going to go for about half an hour. And so what they do is move the straps to the left so you slide your arm through it. So it rests not on your wrist, but the weight is on your shoulder. Now what that does is move the shield to your left so that you protect the person next to you rather than yourself. It only protects half of you. And it protects the right half of the person next to you. Which means the people on the furthest right are the most exposed. So, we have men standing shoulder to shoulder, wearing bronze armor, using a shield and a spear. All of this is to help make it less likely for a farmer to run away. So what does a phalanx battle look like? Well, Greeks are usually fighting other Greeks. Occasionally they'll fight somebody else, but usually Greeks fight other Greeks. So what do they do? They find a flat land between mountains and rivers, something that will protect their sides. Because if you're watching the video, you should notice something. The spears go out in front, protect your front. But there is nothing protecting your sides or your back. Nothing. If you get attacked from the sides or the back, you're dead because you can't turn around. A phalanx cannot break in, in, in parts to defend itself. It can't break into a square, a hollow square in the middle. It would lose all of its weight. It would collapse. So what you do in Greece is find the flat land between mountains and rivers and some place where you can fight it out. And then... It's like a car crash. A phalanx battle is a car crash where they run at each other at speed over the last hundred or so meters, smash into each other in the front. The front rows collide, smash into each other. The back rows, now everybody stops, right? Everyone hits into the person in front of them because it's a car crash. 
Uh, if you've never seen the movie, one of the things when I was learning to drive that impressed me the most is that the car crash, the things that causes the car crash is usually not the guy right behind you. It's the guy behind him because you hit your brakes, right? So your lights go on. The guy behind you has still moved at 55 miles per hour. So he's moved maybe a thousand feet in the time between seeing your, you saw what you needed to see, you hit your brakes. Now they see the, the your taillights, they hit their brakes. They've already traveled about a thousand feet. Well, the person behind them has now had two seconds. They've traveled 2000 feet. And so they have even less time to hit their brakes. And if there's a fourth person, they have even less time because they've now traveled 3000 feet. And so you can see what happens. The, the, the front stops, boom, but everybody else keeps moving. And so they collide into each other. So it's a giant car crash and the back rows push the front rows forward. They literally will take their shields, put it into the back of the people behind them and push forward so that the two sides, the two phalanxes become so intermoshed. It's like a giant mosh pit. And in the middle are guys trying to stab each other. The spears have all broken. They've all smashed because they're big, long. They're ten, they're eight to ten feet long. So they hit the shield. They may hit, hit your armor. They'll bend. The weight behind them will push. It'll bend more and break. So what you do is you turn your spear around, which has this, this dagger, basically, at the, bo at the back. Or you might carry a little dagger, not a short sword. There's no room for it. And you try to stab someone in the face, right? You're trying to stab them in the neck. You're trying, this is why you also wear the armor, to try to protect as much of you as possible. Um, and the idea is that these two phalanxes become so intermeshed that people who, who they get become separated from the people they're protecting and from being protected. And what happens is they, they freak out and they run away and they run away. They start from the middle or the back. They bleed out the sides and they, they run away. One side runs away. The other side laughs. Ho, 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 ho. Yeah, so they, they do the job of laugh, you know, and you get a bunch of bearded Greek men. They all laugh. Ho, 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 ho. And then they erect a trophy, which is what's called a turning stone because the other side turned away. They erect a trophy. And then among all the dead people, they wait. They, they collect their dead and they wait. They strip the body armor off the dead, the people they killed. Right. And then they wait and they wait for the other side. They just defeated for the defeated side to send negotiators. Because what do the what does the defeated side want? They want their dead bodies back. They want their kin. They want their brothers. They want their fathers. They want their bodies so they can bury them. Otherwise, you just leave them and the animals get them. And nobody wants that. And so they show up. You negotiate. You say, I own your gold mine for five years. They say, great. And we sign it. Boom. It goes onto the trophy. It gets carved in stone. Everybody swears to the gods that they will not break the truce. They will not break the peace for five years. They'll uh, abide by the treaty. And this is a big deal because it's it's the gods. Remember, you're poor and living in the mountains. You need the gods to be on your side. So you don't do stuff to tick them off. And so you negotiate an end. And that's that's it. It's one day. A war should last like one day. It's a weekend. And then like like a couple weeks later, you go fight somebody else. You go fight another one of your neighbors. So Greek phalanx battles are horrible if you're in them. But a Greek war is not so bad because it's one, maybe two battles, and then it's over. You negotiate. They're over quickly because these guys are farmers. They need to get back to their farms and they're poor. They don't have time to have long wars of attrition. Now, notice... That will change when we get to the Peloponnesian War. So the youngest men are going to be in the middle. Why? Because they're the least experienced. They're the most likely to run away. And they can't. They physically can't run away. And these are our guys who are like 16 to 20, 22 or so. Their job is to add weight to the push. Nothing else. They essentially have no, no role. They don't know what they're doing. They're scared to be doing it. The idea is they, they're, they're, they're there to help the phalanx make weight. Because remember, you're pushing into each other. You need as much weight as possible. 
the oldest, most experienced men, the 35-year-old plus guys, are in the back. Why? Why are they in the back? Because they've done it. They did it. They've been there. They've done it. They've been in the middle. They've been in the front. They're older. They're in the back. They're replacing the guys, the old guys who retired. They're also institutional knowledge. There's plenty of battles. There's a famous one where the Athenians are fighting the Thebans. And the Thebans are renowned for being tough, for being like tough hillbilly folk. They're tough. And you get all these new young guys who are like, I've never fought the Thebans before. They're, they're supposed to be scary. And you've got the guys in the back who are like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. We kicked their ass 20 years ago when I was your age. They're a bunch of wimps. Oh, just give them a good push. Punch them in the nose. They'll run away. That's your institutional knowledge. You want those guys in the back. So who's in the front? If the youngest men are in the middle and the oldest guys are in the back, the most experienced guys are in the back, where are your youngest guys? Where, where are your middle experienced guys? Where are your 20-somethings? They are in the front. Why? Because they want glory. These are guys that were in the middle. For a year, two years, three years. Well, how much glory do you get being in the middle? You can't see anything. You can't do anything. And hey, if you've ever been on a sports team, you know what you do after a great victory. You party. You get pizza. You get wings. You get some drinks. And you party. And you tell stories about the game. Well, the Greeks do the same thing. Except they get drunk, because they're Greeks, and they try to impress women. Because they're men. So they're getting drunk and trying to get nookie. Well, the young men in the middle of the phalanx aren't going to get any. Because if they go, well, I got to kill six Persians. All of the guys in front of him are going to yell at him out. They're going to all block him. They're going to be like, no, 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 lady. Come and see. Come and sit with real men who really fight. Right? There's no glory in the middle because you're not really part of the battle. You don't have a role. The heavy fighting is in the front. So young men in their 20s and their 30s want to gain glory. They want to get a name for themselves. And you go, well, why don't the old guys stand there in the front? And it's like, dude, they've done it. So like, think of the party, right? So the young guys are in the middle and they're making stuff up. And people are like, no, that didn't happen. That just didn't happen. Stop. Go well, why don't you just serve the wine? Just shut up, kid. You got your guys in your mid-20s and your early 30s being like, oh, I killed this guy. I stopped. I stabbed him in the face and his brain exploded. And the guy next to him was like, oh, that was awesome. But remember, you were about to get an axe in the head and I put my shield up and protected you. It's like, oh, that was great. Let's drink. And there's women there like, oh, you men are so awesome. And they're like, of course we're awesome. We're in the front. But sitting at a table... Over at the side of all this, there's a bunch of old farts with a gray in their beard, right? And they're like, <laughs> look at these kids. They think that was a battle. Dude, we were over in like five minutes. We ran right over them. Dude, do you remember when we were at Artemisian? Oh my God, that was a battle. Yeah, I had to kill. How many demons did we have to kill each? Like 10 each? Like they just wouldn't stop. They wouldn't run away. They just, we had to kill them all. Oh my God. They were awful. We had just, oh, I got so, I was, I was sore for three days after that battle. And these kids, these kids think, oh, fighting a bunch of these guys, please. So you get that. And so there's this natural rotation of men through the army, right? Young men are constantly coming into the middle guys in the middle are moving to the front guys in the front are moving to the back as guys in the back retire as they die as they get old and so there's this natural movement and this natural accommodation of people you know where you're supposed to be you know what your position is in the army you know who you are and what your value is and you know what will happen where you're going are you going to retire soon are you going to move to the front So, remember the goal. The goal of a phalanx is to make sure people don't run away. If you don't run away, you win. Remember, the goal is not victory. The goal is not to run away. And if you don't run away, you'll gain victory. 
So what the Greeks figure out real fast is you put family next to each other. You don't put strangers. You put like like my Marine students who call each other their brothers. I've had students who were in, in Afghanistan together. And they're like, oh, he's my brother. He's my brother from another mother. Well, in the, in, and I have no doubt about that. But in the Greeks, they were literally brothers put next to each other. Why? Because if you went home, if you ran away in the middle of the battle and you went home and you showed up at home and you said, hi, mom, what's your mom's question going to be? It's not, oh, how'd the battle go? No, it's, where is your brother? Well, I guess he's still fighting back there. You get back there. Don't you leave your brother. How dare you? Right? They, so they put fathers next to sons, brothers next to brothers, cousins next to cousins. People who you wouldn't want to leave because, one, you either love them or you're too embarrassed to ever see them again. So you're going to fight for them. The Thebans and the Spartans go a step further to make their armies the best. And the Spartans have the best army. There is no doubt about it. They have the only professional army in, the, in, in Greece. They have the best fighting men. How much better than the Athenians? It's not really by much. So you can make the argument that the Spartans spend a whole lot of energy to not get a lot of clearance on their army. But it is a much better army. I mean, it can do things on the battlefield. Just nobody else can do. It could turn. Spartans are so good, their phalanxes can literally turn. Nobody else could do that. Because they all have to move. They all have to turn together. So if you go back to the to the picture of the Spartans walking, notice one of them is blowing horns, a pan. It's blowing music. The 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 most they walked the Spartans walked in step. The Thebans are known as these tough tough farmer hill people, and the Thebans are going to have a very good army as well. They'll pro- they're at least as good as Athenians, and later on they're actually better than the Spartans, but. Lots has to happen before that happens. But the Thebans are typically the second or the third, depending on how good you think the Athenians are. And what they did was encourage homosexuality. They put lovers in the phalanx together. They wanted men to love each other a lot. Physically. Emotionally. The sacred band of Thebes, the best unit, the best phalanx in the Theban army, had 300 homosexual pairs together. So the Thebans and the Spartans encouraged homosexuality and it made their armies better. Why? Because they didn't run away. You weren't going to leave your lover. So these societies understood that and they were perfectly cool with that. They're like, they encouraged it. They wanted it to happen. So what are the results? The results are that a phalanx allowed untrained footmen to stand, fight, and survive for the first time in battle. Remember when we talked about farmers don't fight, and if you fight nomads, you die? The phalanx changes that. This is very different from the Middle Eastern armies that are based on chariots or based on cavalry. Now, you, you can say, well, the Greeks are weird. They're in mountains. And I'd say, yes, that makes them different. That allows them to build this army this way. Geography definitely is a bit of destiny here. But it also gave their farmers the confidence to fight battles in a way nobody else does. So how do you gain legitimacy? How do you get farmers to fight? There's no money. Well, the Greeks invent something completely new. Nobody else has it. There isn't even a word for it in other places. And that's citizenship. This idea of this mutual connection between the city and the people. You are a citizen. You are one of us. You're part of our group. You have rights and responsibilities. Now, what is the number one right you're going to have? Well, let's do the responsibility first because that's easy. What is your responsibility? To fight in war when the city needs you. What is your right? 
to have a say in deciding the government, the laws, the policy, and whether or not to go to war. Because if you're going to do the fighting, maybe you don't want to fight the Thebans this year. Maybe you think that's a dumb idea. You need to be able to say no. And make an argument for why you shouldn't. And other people can get up and say, yes, we should fight the Thebans and make an argument why. And then, well, how do you decide whether to have a war or not? Well, you have a vote. Now, that is not democracy. That is an assembly. And we'll talk about the differences. It may sound like a democracy, but it depends on who leads it. And who usually leads the assembly is rich oligarchs, rich guys. They bring them together and they go, and this is kind of in a way how the Roman Republic works. Rich guys bring the, bring the citizens together, the men, the voting age men, and they say, I would like to fight. We should fight the Thebans. And then they would explain why. And then they would say, what do you people think? And mostly you get nobody talks. Like, I've done assemblies for professors like most of my career and you'll get a couple people and they're the normal regular couple people but there'll be a 200 people in the auditorium most people do not talk they have a they they think they have they have an attitude towards what they want to happen but they don't usually engage in the debate usually they go along with what the guys in charge say they say look this is the best calendar for when we should have our vacation days. And everybody you says, oh, okay, if you say so. So when the so when the, the eight guys at the table get up, the richest eight guys, they get up and they go, we think we should fight the Thebans. Most people go, okay, okay. But you have the right to get up and say yes or no, to agree or disagree. That is autonomia. That is autonomy right there in the assembly government. There is your independence. Nobody else will enforce the rules on you. But this is not a demos. This is not a democracy. This is not the assembly running itself. This is usually an oligarchy. This is rich, smart dudes getting together the other citizens in the army because everybody has to fight and telling them what they want to do and asking for their okay. What about women? Well, women can't fight. Women can't fight in the army. They can't wear the bronze armor. It's too heavy. And so they're not citizens. They can't have a say in the government. So they have no rights. So how are they treated? Like children. They have a protected status as women. They are not citizens. Because they can't be in the army. And if you have to be in the army to gain your citizenship. So famous people, Pericles, will pick up a shield and a spear. Socrates will be at the Battle of Delium. D-E-L-I-U-M. He'll fight at the Battle of Delium. One of the most horrible massacres that happens to the Athenians. Socrates is almost killed. We'll talk about that later. Women could not participate. And this will be a, the core of a play called Lysistrata of how war affects women. And the men will go, well, at least you don't have to fight. You don't have to bleed. You don't have to suffer. And the women go, we don't suffer. We don't suffer. Who do you think you're talking to? My father is dead. My son is dead. I didn't suffer. And so, but since women can't fight in the army, they are not citizens so how do you get democracies you gain democracies by navies why well first is navies are rare and expensive they're expensive and require a lot of manpower to row and that's partly why they're rare they're rare because they're expensive and they require a lot of manpower and they're rare because they require a lot of manpower and are expensive and so democracies are very rare there's more than just Athens, but there's not many. And the reason why is because the, sh the fighting ship is called the Trireme. T-R-I-R-E-M-E. -E. It is a f ship basically built for, for fighting that has three, three ranks of oars. 
See, the wind in the Eastern Mediterranean is not dependable. And so for until like the 1500s, like the Turkish Navy is mostly galleys because a lot of time the wind flows from west to east. So a lot of the time you're against the wind. So what you do is you row, you, you have, you, you can't rely on the wind. So you need oars. Well, a trireme had 200 oarmen and a ram. And so a trireme fought like a phalanx at sea. It just crashed into you. And then it backed up, backed up, backed up and rammed you again, punched a big hole in your hull. It would fill with water. Your ship would sink. Now, those 200 oarmen, why do they matter? They matter because Athens, for example, had 300 ships in its navy. Now, usually it would only have 200 out at any one time, but it could put all 300 out. Because you remember, you're always fixing ships. You got dry docks. You're always repairing stuff, right? As, as, as the old saying goes, as my father used to say, a ship is a hole in which you put a ship in, wa in the water that you pour money into. But if Athens had 300 ships and 200 men per ship, that means it required 60,000 rowers in a city of like 300,000 people. Remember, that 300,000 people, half of them are women. So 60,000 rowers out of 150,000 people. That's a huge percentage of your population, way bigger than a phalanx of 300 or 500 people. And what happens? Well, if you row for six to eight hours a day, eating a high protein, low carb diet of mostly fish, and you do this for four months, the sailing season from May to September, when you get off the boat, you're ripped. So these are ripped young men, usually about 25 to 40 years of age. And because they couldn't be farmers, they needed to get paid. So the state pays them because they're providing defense for the city. So the state pays them. Now they have nothing to spend that money on. So when they get off the boat, they are ripped with money in their pockets. Do they have confidence? Hell yeah. They defended the city. And so could you tell them to stop, to shut up, to go away? And the answer is no. You have to ask their opinion. They're too young. They're too ripped. They're too financially independent. And they are too confident. And that's how you get a democracy. Anyone can row. Now, what does a democracy mean? It means the assembly is sovereign. Remember when I said uh, there's a table of eight guys and they get up and they say, hey, I would really like to go and fight with thieves this year. That doesn't exist in a democracy. In a democracy, the, P the assembly chooses its own leader. It has an election every year and it says, we vote for Pericles to be in charge. But Pericles knows the assembly is really in charge, that the democracy is in charge. But you need somebody to organize the meetings to make sure you talk about the right things. But the assembly runs itself. Take a look at how we run our class. Did you get to choose how many tests there are? No. Did you get to choose when those tests are? No. Did you get to choose um, what the questions on the test would be? How many questions there would be? How hard those questions would be? No, 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 no. I did. Now, are we a dictatorship? No. Our class is not a dictatorship. I can't make you do anything. I can control you. I can beg you. I can ask you. I can use punishment like failing grades, but I can't make you do anything. So the best way I know how to do run, run the show is as an assembly. I ask your opinion. I say, look, I would like to do this, these tests in five weeks. We, we, we need to have X amount of tests and I would like to have them in five, every five weeks because we're a 15 week class. And usually... You all say, okay, we'll accept it. Okay, fine. But a democracy can say, professor, um, one, 
we didn't put you in charge, so we're voting to not make you professor anymore. So you can sit down, please. Thank you. Um, we're also gonna we're gonna we're gonna vote for a new professor. And how many tests should we have? One test. I say we have one test. Can we have a show of hands of how many people want one test? Well, why don't we have zero tests? And I'll be there, being the smart guy, being like. The school requires to have a grade, and that grade has to be at least has to have a grade from a test. Has to have something you could show. So here, see, I'm now I'm now the parliamentarian. I went from the professor to the guy who just knows the rules, right? So I'm the parliamentarian. So I'm like, you have to have a test. So they go, okay, but do does it say how many tests we have to have? And I'll say there are there is nowhere that says how many tests you have to have. You just have to have a test. And so let's have one test. Okay. Is there any rule about what can be on that test? There is no rule. Well, then how about we have a true false one question test? And the question is, uh, is the sun going to come out tomorrow? And someone will say, really, we're going to have our test based on a musical song from Annie. And you go, so yes, so we can all get it correct. Is there anything wrong with that, ex-professor? And I will say, no, that is all abiding by the rules. You can do any of that. You are a democracy. And that's that's a class choosing its own test, choosing its own professor. That's how democracies work. They choose their own path. So they're, the leader of the assembly is not the leader of society. The leader of the assembly of a democracy is chosen by the by the democracy to basically just organize stuff. They're they're more like secretary. In fact, that's the that's that's the t- title given to the um, to the um, head of the USSR because communism is supposed to be everyone is equal. So they had a secretary as a leader because the secretary's job is not to lead; it's to organize stuff to allow the people to know what. Because you can't have everything to choose from. You have to have limits. Otherwise, you'll never make a decision. So you need someone to say, do we choose A, B, or C? These are what This is what A looks like. This is what B looks like. This is what C looks like. Now, who can be that person? Well, the assembly will choose. They might make a commission. They might make a group. But the assembly runs itself. And that's the most important thing. It's a class that chooses its own tests, chooses its own questions, chooses its own professor. That's a democracy. The assembly runs itself rather than okaying other people's decisions. It makes its own decisions. And you can see how one, that is incredibly confident. Like I have never in my 20 years had students be like, let's talk about these tests. I want to talk about what the questions are. They'll complain about them, but I've never had a group saying, I want to change the nature of our tests, right? Now, we are not a democracy, so that's one reason why. But it's never happened. Everyone says, okay, we have tests. We have 10 tests. Fine. We'll have 10 tests. That's okay. I'll make it work. You know? And so that's that's about a democracy. And you can see how scary that is for your traditional conservative leaders. Like, I'm the professor. If I'm not the professor, then what am I? I'm the leader of our assembly. If you vote me out to not be your professor anymore, I'm now the parliamentarian? Like, that's nice. But you could probably get somebody who would learn the rules too, and then like, then you don't need me at all. So you could see why conservatives, why rich guys, why the oligarchs don't like democracies. Democracies don't like to be told what to do. They decide on their own and leaders, kings, oligarchs like telling people what to do. So that's where we will end in our discussions with democracies and assemblies and the phalanx and war. And in our next um, episode, we will do we will do war. So thank you very much. Be careful. See you soon.